You know, as we're approaching Easter and we're thinking about the life of Jesus and we think about all that Jesus did while he was on this earth, it's phenomenal. But then we also think about how he said that we would do yet greater things. And there is nothing like being used of the Lord. If you have come to know the Lord and you've been used of Him in some way, I mean, there's nothing like it because it is eternal stuff. And I mean, it makes you feel unbelievable. It's like a life that you can't experience any other way when God uses you. When He speaks through you or He has you pray over someone and there's something that happens, there is nothing like it. And God wants us to experience that. And God wants us to know um, how much He values us, how much He loves us. That's why He died on the cross. But I also want to share something else this morning. There's a danger in being used of the Lord. (laughs) There's a danger in experiencing what it is to be used of the Lord. Because in the midst of feeling highly valued of the Lord, which we are, we can start to think, God really needs me. We can start to think, I am just really valued by the Lord. I just, without me, I just don't know what the Lord would do. (laughs) You know, that's one of the things that we've seen in the midst of what's happened to the church the last year is that suddenly we've seen God can do things without us, whoever we are. (laughs) God can do things without us. I want to share that this morning because it's so important to understand. Because in the midst of having God use us and being excited about that, there's a subtleness that can happen there that we can be drawn away from the Lord. And that's what I want to talk about. This appearance of good. This appearance of being used for good things, but becoming so focused on those good things that we forget to really focus on God and honor Him. You know, as I'm saying this right now, I'm thinking about Moses. And I've been reading through Deuteronomy lately. And you think about how God used him so powerfully. But then there was that moment where God told him to make him holy before the people and to bring forth water from the rock. But instead of doing it the way that God said... (laughs) He takes his staff and hits the rock and says, basically, here you go, you bunch of rebellious jerks. You've been whining, so I'm going to give you water. Instead of really honoring the Lord. Because Moses, after being used of God, he subtly stopped pointing the attention to God. And he started thinking highly of himself. You know, when you look in Scripture, almost everyone that is used powerfully of the Lord reaches a time where God humbles them because they start to think so highly of themselves. And you know what? Sometimes the humbling can even come after death. You know, one of the things that we've seen recently, some of you may be aware, some of you not, But there was a person who died this last year who had a powerful ministry. His name was Ravi Zacharias. He had an international ministry. I mean, it was super powerful. It had impacted my life in in many ways. Um, You know, when I would listen to many of the teachings that came through that ministry, you know, one of the things that always grabbed me is that he had a powerful team of ministry, but you know, whenever I would hear the other team members speak, it was always good, but when Ravi would speak, I mean, there was a gifting and an anointing that would come out of him. I mean, it was powerful, and God was using him not only in the U.S., but God was using him all over the world, and I mean, it was powerful stuff. 
And then after he passed, his ministry continued on. But then something came out. Something came out that maybe he was allowing his flesh to have control in places that he shouldn't. And so they decided to do an investigation. And I'll be honest with you, when I first heard about the investigation, I was mad. I was like, are you kidding me? This guy walked with the Lord. He's dead and you're about to trash his name and take it through the mud. I'm like, what are you doing? But out of that, what came out is that there were truth in the allegations that had been made. And now after his passing, his ministry has taken a nosedive. Here's why I bring this up. I bring this up because along the path of his life, he began to neglect certain things in his life because of this. Because I believe he thought his ministry was so important that it was okay to neglect other things. Because God was using him so powerfully that God needed him. Over and over in Scripture, God makes it clear God does not need any of us. As powerfully as he used Moses, he said, Moses, you're done. You're done. I'm going to use somebody else to bring these people into the promised land. Because Moses reached a point where he didn't honor the Lord. Now, you and I are not Moses, but we all have callings. And we are used by the Lord in powerful ways. And we will continue to be used of the Lord in powerful ways. But it's so crucial in the midst of that, that when we start to see the flesh come out, that we stop ourselves and go, whoa, what's going on here, Lord? I shared with you that not long ago I had that happen in my life. I found that on a regular basis, I was walking around mad. <laughs> I mean, I was just mad all the time. And I, I mean, I just, it's like I didn't want to, but my flesh just kept coming out. And it's, what is going on here, Lord? And at first, you know whose fault it was? It was yours. <laughs> yeah, it was all, all you, every, everybody else in the world. It was everybody's fault but mine. That's why I was mad. <laughs> and then, <laughs> finally, after experiencing the fruit of that over and over and over, I finally humble myself and go, okay, what's going on? And shocker of all shockers, the issue was me. I, it's un I know, you're shocked. You're like, what? <laughs> I, thank you. <laughs> but the deal was, is that I was putting other things before God. And I, I didn't know it. Because the things I was focused on had the appearance of good. You see, I was focused on the things in the nation. I was like, are you kidding? I gotta make this stuff right. I gotta fight for this stuff. And so, instead of being focused on ministering to the people in front of me, I'm thinking about the person I went to high school with that lives about six hours away from me, and they're putting stupid stuff on Facebook. And they're saying stuff they would never say to my face. Because they know I would not just stand there. But yet six hours away, man, they're just letting it roll. <laughs> so I'm thinking about what that person needs and, you know, how to straighten them out. And I'm mad. And instead of expressing that to them, I express it to my family. <laughs> you know, it's like kicking the dog because, you know, you're mad at something. And what God began to show me is that in actuality, I was more concerned about the comfort of my American life than I was the kingdom. Instead of being concerned about growing the kingdom and whatever it took, even if it means an oppressed, uncomfortable American life, I was putting the American life above <clears throat> Jesus and above the kingdom. But that was a hard place to get to. And it took really reaching the brink of just, honestly, just wanting to give up ministry to get to that point of, okay, something is wrong. 
So before we get into the Word this morning, I, I just want to say this. If you're walking around through that, if you're having you know, anger, anything of the flesh, fears, lust, whatever it is, if you're having regular stuff come out, that probably means that you are focused somewhere that's not on the Lord. Even though you think it is. Even though you think it's something good. You're, you're, you're probably not focused on the Lord. You know, I think of um, Jesus and when He spoke to the Pharisees. And if you've been reading through Mark, that's where we're reading through as a church right now, as we're reading through Mark as we're approaching Easter. You know, one of the, one of the uh, chapters we read through in Mark this week talked about Jesus confronting the Pharisees because they were all up in arms about Jesus and His disciples not doing the ceremonial hand washings and, you know, the traditions of the elders. But what Jesus said was that what, in essence, they were doing is that they were using those outward things to focus on so they didn't have to focus on the real issues of their heart, which was full of ugliness. And you see, what I found is I was doing the same thing. I was focused on other people's issues. Why? Because then I don't have to focus on me. I don't have to focus on this stuff because this stuff gets ugly. It's way easier to get mad at you for your stuff and to focus on that than to look at this. But this is the only way that I find healing, and this is the only way that I can really be used of God. Because otherwise, I become like the Pharisees. Were they being used of God? Mm -mm. They thought they were. They thought they were, but in actuality, what were they doing? They were coming against God, and they would eventually kill the Son of God. And the whole time, they think they're doing it for the Lord. So I just want to say to you, if those things are coming out of you, if those flesh things, there's probably some redirection that needs to happen. All right, I want to look at an example of this in Scripture. Uh, the place I want to go to is 1 Kings chapter 11. And we're going to look at the first 13 verses of that. So, what we find in the context here before I read is we're going to be talking about King Solomon. King Solomon was the son of King David, and Solomon was impressive. I mean, Solomon got it in ways that few of us do. You know, one of the times that the Lord appeared to Solomon, he said, Solomon, what do you want? I'll give it to you. And instead of Solomon asking for things in this world, he asks for wisdom in order to serve others. This guy gets it. His life is not about himself. His life is about others and serving them. And so God blesses him with that. And because he's so focused on the Lord, he gives him all the other stuff that he didn't ask for. But here's the problem. As wise as Solomon was, and as we see that he was focused on the Lord, he started to think that he could handle things that he couldn't. He started to think more highly of himself than he should. Let me go back to Ravi for a second. One of the places where I believe Ravi messed up, he was going all over the world sharing the gospel. But from what I understand, his wife wasn't with him. He thought that he could handle that. He thought that that would be okay. But I think what he found is that he couldn't. And then eventually, he kept getting deeper and deeper because anytime you, you step into sin, it's embarrassing. And so you're like, ah, oh, well, I'll get this taken care of myself. But it drags you in deeper. And you're like, oh, man, this is getting ugly. But I'm still good. I can, I can get out of this. I can get out of this. And then before long, we're so deep, we're like, I can't do anything about this. I, I mean, if I, this, this will, you know, shatter everything. Uh, and so we, we just never seek help. Well, in the same way, as we go to King Solomon, what we're going to find is we're going to find someone who thought he could handle things that God had warned him about. Because after all, this is the wisest man in the world. This is the one who, when God came and said, I'll give you anything, he used it to serve others. Surely, surely Solomon can't fall. Surely, you and I, as much as we know the Lord, we can't fall, can we? We can't be pulled away. 
Surely not. I mean, because we, we've experienced the Lord, right? Well, let's see what happened to Solomon. Verse 1. Now, King Solomon loved many foreign women. He, he, he didn't say he hated. He loved. Love is a good thing, is it not? How many songs have we heard? All we need is love. Well, this guy loved. Besides Pharaoh's daughter, he married women from Moab, Ammon, Edom, Sidon, and from among the Hittites. But now look at verse 2. The Lord had clearly instructed the people of Israel. Clearly. Okay? This wasn't a side note. Clearly. You must not marry them. Because they will turn your hearts to their gods. Yet Solomon insisted on loving them anyway. Now, here's the thing. When you look at this, there's a mixture that's going on. On the one hand, he's wanting to feed his flesh. But on the other hand, there is justification. Because this is how we always fall into this. There's good justification for feeding our flesh, okay? We always come up with it, do we not? Well, in this instance, by marrying these foreign women, he was the king. He was helping bring security and prosperity to the people. Remember, his heart was for serving. Well, he was serving people by doing this. Because what he was doing was, he was forming alliances with all these other nations. This actually was not for him, it was for everybody else. Anytime I sin, you can know it's for you, actually. It's not even for me. I'm taking a hit for the team. <laughs> That's what Solomon was doing. I guarantee you that that was the thoughts that came through his mind and the minds of others that he sold them on. Listen, this is for everybody. We, we need to bring security. I'm the leader of the nations. The more marriages I have with foreign nations, they're not going to attack us. They're going to become our allies. They're going to support us. I am actually serving God's people by doing this. Back to Ravi. Again, what was he doing? He was on the road all the time away from his family. And what was he doing? He was spreading the gospel. I mean, come, people are coming to the Lord. He, is be, he, is, he was given um, access to all kinds of powerful people that did not know the Lord. Those people come to the Lord. Well, they've got the potential to lead nations to the Lord. This was important stuff. He does not have time to play house. God needs him. That's what he's thinking. And so he continues to go and to go. And because of that, he turns from his family, but the result is, is that he would end up falling. He would end up falling in such a way that would bring the house down. Solomon, same way. Solomon thinks, no, I'm good. And at first, you know what? I'm sure he stayed strong. And as we're going to read in the passage, that's what it appears to say. He keeps focused on the Lord. He makes these alliances with the other nations by bringing in foreign wives, but he stays focused on the Lord. The enemy's end game is not for today or tomorrow. The enemy's end game is years down the road. He wants you to take little steps today. He will never get you to take big steps, okay? I mean, if he can, then he'll go for it. But most of you are not going to do that. But what I will do is, I'll do, I'll do a little side step if it appears good, okay? Oh, Kirk, you're needed for ministry here. I, I, I know that you're you know, turning away from some other things, but you know, you're the one that's needed for this. You're the one. Begin to pull away, pull away, and years down the road, then it's like, oh, I got off target. We've talked about that before. Just a little off target now, won't notice it. Years down the road, you're way off target. That's what happened with Solomon. Verse 3, he had 
three, or I'm sorry, 700 wives of royal birth. I mean, that's nuts. I mean, I really can't believe that he started off thinking that. But you just, you keep going, you know? You keep going. And 300 concubines. And in fact, they did turn his heart away from the Lord. I, I haven't seen God face to face. I, he hasn't appeared to me the way he appeared to Solomon. I, I, I mean, this is phenomenal that God would appear to him not only once, but twice. And then again, Solomon doesn't use it for himself. I, I mean, this guy clearly gets it. But the problem is, is that you can get it today, but if you don't walk in humility and you start to think too highly of yourself, you know, go back to King Saul, okay? At first, King Saul's like, what? You, you can't choose me, God. I'm a nobody. And the next thing you know, he's willing to kill anybody that would try and take his position. You can become a completely different person. If you don't walk in humility, keep your eyes on the Lord. Verse 4, in Solomon's old age, they turned his heart to worship other gods instead of being completely faithful to the Lord his God. I mean, I really think he was doing good at first. You know, and as the years go by, I'm good. I'm still focused on the Lord. But then what happens? It keeps wearing, it keeps wearing, it keeps wearing. You're in a family situation, okay? You're supposed to love these people. You're supposed to provide for these people. And they keep uh, ignoring your God. They keep focusing on this other God. And, and, you know, you have a heart for them. You're connected to them. You want to, quote, love them. And so what happens? You slowly start to want to please them. Well, what if pleasing them means going against the Lord? Well, at first he would have said, no way. But you know what? Years down the road, you get worn down, do you not? I mean, how many of us have complained that the youngest kid gets away with way more than the oldest kid? I mean, why? Because parents get worn down. I mean, do we not? I mean, I look at some of you parents who have the little kids now, and I'm like, how did I ever survive that? I, I, I mean, it... it we get worn down. But Solomon wasn't thinking about that in the beginning. He thought he had this. Sol verse 5, Solomon worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. In this way, Solomon did what was evil in the Lord's sight. He refused to follow the Lord completely, as his father David had done. And that's what we see in our American culture. Even for those who bring God in, God is added to everything else. God is not satisfied with that. God is either the only one, or He is not your God. He will not be added in to all these other pursuits. And again, what happens is, I think we start off with, you know, when you think of Solomon, I'm sure he gave in a little to one, and then before long, well, he's got to give in to everybody because he's got to make it fair. So before long, he's building monuments and whatever else, altars to all these gods. Why? Because he did it for one. You've got to keep on doing it. He started down the path, and the further down the path he got, the further harder it was to turn away. Verse 7, on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem, he even built a pagan shrine for Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and another for Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. Solomon built such shrines for all his foreign wives to use for burning insects, incense, not insects, and sacrificing to their gods. The Lord was very angry with Solomon. For his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. He had warned Solomon specifically about worshiping other gods. But Solomon did not listen to the Lord's command. Now again, God had warned him specifically. How does he go against that? Well again, it didn't happen the day after God warned him. Because at that point, those words are loud in his mind. But here's what happens. 
As time goes on, he keeps hearing the words of his wives over, over, over. And there's more and more distance between what God said to him. And he just keeps further and further away. I mean, again, <laughs> it doesn't matter what you've experienced with the Lord. It doesn't matter what you've heard from the Lord. If you start opening yourself up to other voices, it's eventually going to take over. You know, again, this is what I shared. The Lord showed me I had to come to a point where I had to shut everything else out. All of social media. I had to shut the news. I had to shut it all out. Because I was in a place where I had to completely refocus. Now, where's the, is the Lord going to let me open some of those doors back up? I don't know. But right now, as of today, unless you tell me something that's going on, I don't even know. And you could say, oh, Kirk, that's so bad. Well, you know what? I was in a bad spot, and I had to get serious. God says that if your arm is making you sin, cut it off. Get serious. And that's where I had to go, because I was absolutely filled with anger. I was walking in the flesh, and I didn't know how to get out of it. I had to shut down the other voices that I was allowing to speak into me. And I had to begin to realign myself with the voice of God and hear His voice. And you know what? As I've done that, here's what I've been reminded of. I've been reminded of times when I was so much younger and walking with the Lord. Because during those times, I was totally focused on the Lord. Because it was so new and I was so excited. But as I've matured, I've decided I can let other things in because I'm so mature and smart. I can handle and navigate it all. No, no I can't. In many ways, I'm the same person who first came to the Lord. And that's where I need to say, stay. I don't want to pick things up unless God says, pick it up. I, 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 I don't want to walk in this place of thinking too highly of myself. It's a subtle trap, but the enemy can sure enough take us there. All right, I want to finish this out. Verse 11, So now the Lord said to him, Since you have not kept my covenant and have displayed, disobeyed my decrees, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your servants. But for the sake of your father David, I will not do this while you are still alive. I will take the kingdom away from your son, and even so, I will not take away the entire kingdom. I will let him be king of one tribe for the sake of my servant David and the sake of Jerusalem, my chosen city. The consequences for Solomon were huge. But you know what? Some of those consequences didn't come till after his passing. Sometimes because the Lord doesn't immediately come down on us, we think, oh, God must approve. God must be okay with this because he's not doing anything about it. Don't misjudge the Lord's mercy and grace for not bringing about what is just. God will bring about what is just. And I don't want others to suffer because I was not humble enough to be real with the Lord because I thought too highly of myself. So I just want to, to, to say to you this morning that as God uses you, He's going to use you in powerful ways. But don't give in to that subtle temptation to think, oh, I, I'm needed by God. God doesn't need me. God can do anything without me. He chooses to use me. He chooses to use you because He loves you. Because He loves you. But don't mistake that love for thinking that you are the focus. <laughs> You're not the focus. He is. He is always the focus. And we are created to reflect His glory. Lord, we want to reflect